had a bad dream? I'm guessing it's something we've all had, right? We had a dream that uh, kept repeating, maybe. It was a recurring dream that you had over and over again. Maybe it was a dream where you're falling, where you're trapped in some way, or someone was attacking you. Maybe it was a dream of trying to stay awake during a sermon after eating a delicious brunch. But we've all had bad dreams. And uh, we're in the stage of parenting now where it's not us so much having the bad dreams, it's our children having the bad dreams. And so there's nothing like a child waking you up at three in the morning, shaking you this far from your face. Daddy, I'm scared, I've had a bad dream. If I have a heart attack, that's why, just so you know. And in those moments, I find myself saying something to my kids that you've probably said to your kids if you're a parent. You say, it's just a dream. Don't worry, it was just a dream. It's okay, go back to sleep. It was, sun, it was a dream, don't worry about it. And that's what we say to our children post-enlightenment because we know scientifically that uh, our brains are resting as we sleep and in the dream stage, our mind has released all inhibitions and it is dreaming of these weird whimsical things that make you feel like you're on some of those mushrooms they sell in Denver. But I need to take you to a different world, to a different time, to a different place in the Old Testament where dreams had meaning. So we're in our second week in the series of Daniel and smashed between two of the most recognizable stories in all of the Old Testament is this one story that we seem to overlook oftentimes, but it is equally as powerful as the other stories. So Israel's been conquered by Babylon. They've been stripped of their land. They've been stripped away of their rights of worshiping their God. Israel, both spiritually and, uh, and nationally as a country, is at risk of losing all that they have. They're working on assimilating them into the Babylonian culture and Israel will go away just like had happened earlier with 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. But meanwhile, meanwhile, where they're at risk of this happening again, more of their national identity, of their faith being stripped away, these four brave boys show up. And in the first chapter we saw last week, they are 10 times better than any of the other officials serving for King Nebuchadnezzar. And they find themselves serving a pagan king. And so what are kings always worried about? Not going potty. That's a mother's job. <laughs> kings are always worried about their kingdoms. They're always worried about keeping the throne, holding on to power. That's where we're going to find King Nebuchadnezzar. Because really, well, we're kind of deep down like toddlers. We like to say, oh, that's mine. That's mine. We don't like to share. We like to keep and defend what is ours, and that's what King Nebuchadnezzar is worried about. Let's pray before we get into it. Our Father in heaven, we come before you this week, opening up our Bibles, asking that your spirit would work, that we may see from the examples we see today how to live our faith boldly. May we learn from the generations before us as we read this story of how you have worked and continue to work in the world. So pour through me the gift of preaching that Christ may be formed in hearts. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. So we got a lot of reading today. Bear with me as we jump into chapter 2. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind would trouble. He could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, the enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed when he... When they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, I have had a dream that troubles me, and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, May the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, This is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I'll cut you into pieces. Oh, how comforting. And your houses turned into a pile of rubble. 
But if you tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts and rewards of great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. Okay, so King Nebuchadnezzar knows this is not your standard typical dream. He is disturbed by it. He brings all of his officials in, which it lays out for us here. They're sorcerers, astrologers. It's kind of like a witchcraft kind of thing. And King Nebuchadnezzar is skeptical. He's skeptical about their magical powers. What's going on here? The, the dream, uh, they are to say like, hey, tell us the dream. You know, hey, just tell us and we'll interpret it for you. It sounds like a parent in the middle of the night. Hey, you know, kid, it's okay. It's all right. I'll just tell you what this dream means. It's nothing. Don't worry about it. But Nebuchadnezzar sees through this type of interpretation. So he says, no, no, no. I want you to tell me what the dream was. And I want you to tell me what it means. So listen carefully as this plays out. Once more, they replied, let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain. Um, oh, I went too far ahead. The astrologers answered the king. There is no one on, on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great and mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or en encanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. The astrologers are saying, whoa, 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 King Nebuchadnezzar, what you are asking is impossible. Do not ask us to do this. In fact, they're saying, no human can do this. No one's ever done this before. And the pagan officials lay the foundation for the conflict we see in chapter 2. They give this statement. Did you catch it in verse 11? Only a God could do this. But, but, but gods, they don't live among us. They live in heaven somewhere else. Verse 11 is a dare. Like, oh, if there's a God that can do this, I dare this God to do this. And it reminds us, what is the purpose of Daniel? Well, the purpose of Daniel is to remember and remind us that most of Christianity, most of the times of Scripture, were lived in exile. And as we increasingly move more and more to a time where Christianity is in exile, it answers two really big questions for us. Where is God when all seems to be lost? And how is God working when it seems like God has maybe given up on us. So with careful eyes, I want you to keep these two questions in mind. And may you have eyes to see and may God bless you with this story coming alive to you as we read this. This made the king angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all the wise men in, of Babylon. So the decree was issued to put the wise men to death and men were sent looking for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. This is the problem with kings. They're always so fickle. King Nebuchadnezzar has spent all these time and resources working and training all these officials for him. And he's like, you know what? They're useless. Just go kill them all. And last week we saw as the book opens that Daniel and his, his friends worked so hard to gain this status. And it all seems to be for naught. Everything seems to be lost. And here is what happens next. When Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. He asked the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. At this, Daniel went in to the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. The negotiation skills of Daniel here are impeccable. He goes literally to his executioner. The guy who is supposed to kill him. And he not only asks him for more time, he goes and convinces the king for more time. After gaining this request, he's now going to go back home. 
He's going to gather his friends for this special sleepless night of prayer. Then Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed while the rest of the, with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes of kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and lights dwell with him. I thank and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made me known to me what we asked of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Daniel goes to God in prayer. When everyone seems like, oh, and thinks around them that the pagan gods are really ruling everything, when King Nebuchadnezzar seems to be in charge, Daniel believes in faith that someone else is in fact running the universe. Daniel pleads to God for not only his own life, but Daniel's pleading for the life of the pagan officials as well, that they would be spared. And remarkably, God answers this request, this petition of Daniel, and grants him not only what the dream was, but the meaning of the dream. And Daniel does something here that we can all learn from. Because Daniel's been granted this, but Daniel hasn't gone before the king yet. But before the conflict is even resolved, Daniel starts to worship. He has this beautiful poem of a prayer thanking God for how God is working in the world before the change even happens. And then Daniel goes before the king, and this is what it sounds like. Then Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men in Babylon, and said, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for them. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I have found a man among these, uh, uh, the exiles of Judah, who can tell the king what his dream means. Now, footnote there, notice how Arioch is so prideful. Oh, look what I found. I found this guy that can do this for you. Then the king asked Daniel, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he had asked about. But there is a God. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. As your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed to me not because I have greater wisdom than anyone else, but so that your majesty may know the interpretation and that you may understand what went through your mind. Your majesty looked. And there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partially of iron and partially of baked clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken in pieces and became like chaff on the threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace, but the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Daniel tells the king the dream 
Which remember, the officials just said in verse 11, this is impossible. And Daniel echoes this. No, 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 this is impossible. No one can do this. But the best part comes in verse 28. Daniel gives this statement of faith before the king of the known world, the king who was about to kill him. And Daniel says, nobody can do this. But there is a God. There is a God that rules the heavens and earth and can reveal such mysteries. And so let's see how this God reveals the meaning of this dream to him. And now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands he has placed All mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky, wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for the iron breaks and smashes everything as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush all all the others. Just as you saw, the feet and toes were partially baked of clay and partially of iron. So this kingdom will be divided, yet it will have some of the strength of the iron in it, even as you saw iron mixed with clay. As the toes were partially iron and partially clay, so the kingdom will be partially strong and partially brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it itself will endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. This dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. God gave Nebuchadnezzar a dream of prophecy. You know what's Interesting is God not only gave Daniel the interpretation of the dream, we now have history on our side to prove that this dream came true. The first kingdom, the head of gold, was the kingdom of Babylon. And both biblically and historically, as we saw, the second kingdom that came in was the Persians, who came in and conquered Babylon. The third kingdom was that of Alexander the Great, the Greek kingdom, which came in and destroyed that. The fourth kingdom made of iron, the strongest of these, was the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire had some clay mixed into it. And this would have been an engineering nightmare. They would have known, there's no way you can mix the baked clay with iron. This isn't going to work. And so in Daniel chapter 2, we receive a messianic prophecy, a prophecy of what was going to come in the future. This next kingdom, made out of a mountain carved of stone, not by human hands, this is the kingdom that Jesus brought. This is the kingdom that will live and go beyond all other kingdoms of this world, and one day it will be the only kingdom that ever exists. And so King Nebuchadnezzar is blown away. He's blown away by this truth, by this fact. How does he respond? Well, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor in order that an offering and incense be prepared and presented to him. The king said to Daniel, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries, for you were able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel 
in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, Daniel's requested the, the king appointed to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon while Daniel himself remained in the royal court. All the king can do in response to this, to this incredible piece of prophecy, is to fall down and worship. King Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar makes this incredible statement of faith about Daniel's God. Your God is the God of gods, the Lord of the kings, revealer of mysteries. Daniel and his friends seem to have saved the day once again for the second week in a row, and they are elevated even more into even higher statuses in the country and the kingdom of Babylon for the second week in a row, we see an incredible turn of events. And so here are a few observations that I think we can take away from this. First, look at King Nebuchadnezzar. Look at his actions and how he, he obeys and how he lives and contrast that with Daniel. What is Daniel doing? How is Daniel living? This encounter shows something about it. It shows something about who the true God is. It proves something to the king. The king worships, but ultimately it means nothing to the king. Next week, we'll see King Nebuchadnezzar worshiping a different God. Selfishly, the only thing that King Nebuchadnezzar takes away from this is what it means for him. Oh, my kingdom's going to be good as long as I live. It's going to be fine. I'm not worried about this. You know, all that stuff's off in the future. Who cares? And isn't that the easiest way to live our faith? Isn't the easiest way to live our faith is to show up to church just wanting something from God, asking something from, from God? We show up when we need God something to do something for us. But following God, following God with our lives, actually serving God, committing to God, that's all too easy in our world today to just push off and to set aside. But Daniel shows us something. Daniel just doesn't just sit back idly waiting for God to do something in our life. No, get, get, Daniel takes action. His faith means something to him. Daniel is willing to follow God wherever God leads him. And if that means talking to the executioner, if that means going to the king before himself, Daniel will do so because Daniel believes that he can partner with God. He believes God's the one ruling the universe and he believes in the power of prayer. He believes that he can go home and pray and beg God all night and God will reveal his mysteries and power to him. And so here's a deep truth we really need to hear sometimes. Sometimes we will bring people before God. We will show them how God is working in their lives. They will, and in the moment it will feel so amazing. They'll be on such a spiritual high. Everything will seem to be great. And then when the feeling goes away, they'll move on and never choose to follow Jesus and commit their life to God. But we're called to do something different. We have to make a choice in our life, each of us ourselves. Is our faith just going to be that of a spiritual high where we show up and we say, look, God, what you've done for me. And then we leave God to work uh, for himself and we never choose to work in God's kingdom. We have a decision to make. But Daniel models something else for us. Daniel models for us the correct way to live our lives, how to join God in his world, how to complete this mission, how, how to commit our lives to Christ, to, to God's kingdom, to serving him. And this, highlight, this story also highlights something else, something else that might seem a little strange to us in our world today. Occasionally, God works through dreams. Will we ever experience a dream like King's, King Nebuchadnezzar's? Probably not. I think most of us will probably never experience any of that. Most of our dreams, I think, are probably just dreams. Like I had a dream the Broncos were going to be good this year, but that dream's not coming true anytime soon. Yeah, that is a bad dream. But I think God comes to humans in dreams sometimes because I think it's all we can handle. 
I mean, whenever the angels come, it's a pretty big freakout moment, right? The people are like, whoa, terrible. And the angel usually has to say first off, it's okay, calm down, it's going to be all right. Moses got the closest to seeing God, and seeing God was too much for him, right? He had to hide in the cleft of the rock. God had to place his hand over it. He's glowing after it. We, we can't get that close to God because mortally we just can't handle it. So I think God comes to us in dreams in the calm of the night because God can sometimes communicate things to man in a way that we can handle and understand it. See, this dream, this story oddly sounds a lot like another Old Testament story from the book of Genesis when Joseph was called before Pharaoh to interpret dreams. And then because of this dream he interpreted, got placed in charge of the Egyptian armies and world and saved many of those people. That's what this dream's like. I think of another dream of another Joseph. When Joseph is like, sure, Mary, you're pregnant, and sure, it was the Son of God. And it took an angel coming to Joseph in a dream saying, no, 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 it's going to be all right. And you know what? It's easy to, to hear those dreams and to just think of them as bedtime stories. But you know what's powerful about those dreams? Those same dreams that were given to those people changed our lives, but those same, the power of those same dreams is the power that saves and sets you and I free. So let me tell you of another dream, another dream that occurred after the Bible was written that changed history for you and I. See, for almost 300 years, Christians were heavily persecuted. They dreamed of a day that that would change. That was this persecution until the Roman emperor named Constantine had a dream. He had a dream where he saw an image of a cross in the sky and it said, by this sign, you will conquer. That's what Jesus said to him. By this sign, you will conquer. It was a dream for Christians. It was a dream that one day they would not face heavy persecution. And one day they woke up and that dream became a reality. Could you imagine what it would have been like to have been the Christians living in that generation? They were like, you're seeing your loved ones, your fellow believers dying in the Colosseum. And then one day Christianity becomes the religion of Rome. It would have been unbelievable. It was a miraculous dream that, that really ended the major prosecution of the early church and set up the stage for Christianity to spread throughout the entire world. You know what that moment was? That moment was when the clay met the iron and all of it crumbled over and the stone carved out of a mountain conquered it. And this leads me to this last point. Daniel 2 gives us unsurpassable hope because of our citizenship. You know what? It's pretty cool being an American citizen. We have so many blessings. We have so many great things. We are afforded so many opportunities, so many blessings that we will never understand just because we are American citizens. It reminds me a lot of the Apostle Paul. Because of his Roman citizenship, he was able to do so many incredible things. We're ben we benefit greatly from being American citizens. But let's not forget this. The best citizenship that we could ever ask for, that we could ever want, that we could ever desire is to be citizens of the kingdom of God. Amen. The kingdom, the kingdom of God is the only kingdom that will last forever. We consider this truth, this joy. We get to respond with a joyful confidence, knowing that the Lord has everything under control, even when life might seem chaotic. And that one day God is going to bring all of this together. Heaven will come down and we will live with him forever in God's kingdom. Now, in the meantime, we still have work to do. We're to do everything we can to alleviate suffering, to make this world a safer, happier, happier better place. But however, it means something. And this is great joy in difficult times. Ultimately, our hope isn't in human laws it's not in political alliances. It's not in moral, moral crusades. Our hope is in the Lord, the unmovable 
mountain. So Daniel 2 verse 44 reminds us the only kingdom that will stand forever is Christ's kingdom. So let me give you some hope as I share with you this final story. A few emperors after Constantine came the Roman emperor Julian who hated Christians. He thought the way to make Rome better was to go back and worshiping the Greek gods. He wanted to get rid of this uh, Christianity. And he happened to be battling the Persians in war. He was fighting them in battle when a spear went through him and pierced his liver. Much of the country was very anxious. What would happen after this? Especially his followers. And it's said that one of his closest followers uh, or supporters was so worried about this, was angry, was anxious. What's going to happen to Emperor Julian? And so he comes across a Christian. And he says this weird line to him in his anxiety. He said, hey, what's the carpenter's son doing right now? I mean, what, what kind of a jerk makes this kind of statement? Oh, the carpenter's son. Oh, you know, my God is recovering from surgery right now, having his liver pierced. What's your carpenter's son doing? He died on a cross. What is he doing? And this Christian in Antioch said this line to him that I cannot get over. This Christian in Antioch says, the maker of the world, of the heavens and earth, is current that whom you call the carpenter's son. That guy, that guy is currently employed in making a coffin for your king. And you know what? A few days later, word came that Emperor Julian had died. Died in battle from that spear piercing his liver. And this is where Daniel 2 leaves us today. This is where it sets with us. I leave you with this fact today that gives us peace. Is that Jesus has a coffin for every single empire and every single emperor. The only true security this life has to offer is in the kingdom of God. And history has proved that true to this point. And I believe in faith it will continue to do so. May you have and take with you this faith in this kingdom today. Let's pray as we close. God, so many times it can be so easy for us to see things around us and let it make us anxious about what's going on in the world or what's going on with Christianity. And so may we find so much peace and hope here in Daniel that we know that you haven't given up on us and you haven't given up on the world, that you will continue to work, that you will continue to do amazing things. So God, my ask then for us is that we would have the faith of Daniel, that when difficult things happen, that we would have this wisdom intact to know how to handle the conversations, but that we would have this deep abiding faith, most of all, in you. Because this thing that stands out to me, God, is how Daniel tells us he was just a normal man. He didn't do any of this miraculous stuff. You did it. And so let us have a power, tap into the power of prayer. See how you're working. Let, let us uh, come to you in those trials and have faith that you will answer us, that you will get us through. So we love you, God. And we thank you for this kingdom you've established. We thank you for Jesus establishing this kingdom. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen.